Welcome to Passion for Sound, the channel dedicated to thorough and honest reviews of headphones, earphones, DACs, headphone amps, other components and accessories. Basically everything audio related except power amps and passive speakers. My name's Lachlan and my goal is to explore and discuss all kinds of audio topics, even the controversial ones, to help us all find more enjoyment from music. Thanks for watching and enjoy the video. Hey folks, welcome to another Passion for Sound audio review. Today's review is brought to you by Exhaustion because I've had very little sleep for the last two nights, so hopefully I'll remain coherent and make sense in this review, but also from the wonderful folks over on the forum community at StereoNet Australia New Zealand. You see, I'd listed the Sennheiser HD800S here for sale, having owned it for some time and recently having completed my review of the Focal Utopia, which includes a comparison with the HD800S. I listed these for sale without doing a review because I figured that maybe they were a bit past due and I was a bit late to the party, but a number of people jumped on the sale thread and said to me they'd love to see a review. So here we are. The HD800S have been around for quite a long while now, as I mentioned. They're an 1800 US dollar flagship from Sennheiser in terms of open backs, at least they're the flagship. And for those not familiar, they're actually a revision of the original HD800, which didn't have the S on the end, and aim to improve a few flaws in the original HD800. The big question for me, having owned these for a while, having now compared them to a number of headphones, is whether or not I think they still have a place in today's market, being a relatively old design, albeit having had an upgrade and a bit of a, an adjustment with some of the features built into the HD800S, but are they still on top of their game in 2021? So let's jump in and find out, starting with an explanation of what you get when you buy the HD800S. My exhaustion's already caught up with me. I said in the opening they're an 1800 US dollar headphone. They're actually a 1700 US dollar headphone based on the listings on Amazon. And here in Australia, they're actually only 1900 Australian dollars. So there's an interesting discrepancy there. Normally in Australia, we cop not just the exchange rate difference, but also a little bit extra. And yet in this occasion, the difference in price between US dollars and Australian dollars is not that great. As I said, I've just taken my pricing from Amazon, so I may be a little bit off in some of those numbers, but it gives you a ballpark of roughly where they sit. They're in that sub $2,000 range, but they're certainly up in that flagship level category without going as far as some of the kind of uber flagship top of the line headphones like the Empyreans, the Utopias and the like. The HD800S are a 300 ohm headphone, so they're not going to be the easiest things to drive. They're going to require a fair bit of voltage to drive them, but at the same time, they're pretty sensitive and therefore don't actually require huge huge, huge amplifiers to drive them. What they do require though is quality amplifiers because they're incredibly transparent and incredibly revealing. Before we get to the sound though, I just want to mention a few other bits and pieces as to the design and the accessories. The HD800S is supplied with two cables in the box, a 6.3mm cable and a 4.4mm balance cable. And I think that's really helpful that both are provided. When you're buying a headphone at this level, you really want the versatility to have multiple different connection approaches. And I do like the 4.4mm, even though I'm finding most quality gear is still using 4-pin XLR, it's very easy to adapt a 4.4mm Pentacon connector to a 4-pin XLR. On the other hand, the 4-pin XLR connector is quite a heavy and bulky connector, and so not having that on the end of the cable is a nice change from some of the other high-end headphones I've got. While we're speaking cables, let's talk about something I don't like, and that is the connector that Sennheiser have used. So on the back side of each of these ear cups is a little connector that is unique and proprietary to Sennheiser. Now I'm generally not a huge fan of proprietary connectors, but that's not the reason I don't like these. The reason I don't like them is that once they lock in, the bayonet system is not sprung in any way. It's, it's basically it notches into place. When I say it's not sprung, there are some connectors on the market that have a little bit of give when you're looking to put them in and take them out. 
With the HD800S, it clicks in and it stays in. Now that's good from a security of the connection point of view. Where it's a problem though is if you are changing cables and keeping in mind these come with two cables, if you're looking to go from 6.3 to 4.4 and you're having to remove those bayonet connectors from the headphone, they can very easily come out in a real hurry. You've got to put quite a bit of force on them and then when they give way, they give way fast. The problem, of course, with that is that if it comes out in a hurry, you've got a piece of metal about, you know, yay long, flying past the side of a plastic painted headphone. As I experienced in the worst possible way in my old HD800s, so not the S but the original ones, it's very easy to scratch the side of your headphones during the removal of those cables. So it's not a design that I'm a fan of. The connector itself is high quality. It's secure, as I said. It transmits the signal really well. I just don't like the safety for the headphone when you have to remove it. Now, I've mentioned this in the Utopia review that I did recently, so I don't mean to harp on about it. It's just relevant. If you only watch this review of the HD800S, I didn't want to skip past it, even though I've already talked about it in the Utopia review. So just to wrap up on the cables, they're a really nicely made cable. They've got a nice fabric wrap on them. Everything about them is high quality, and that carries through to the headphones as well. These are one of the best made headphones on the planet, in my opinion. They're solidly made, but they're light. They're super, super comfortable. You almost forget you're wearing these once they're on. Because of the huge size ear cups, they wrap around your ear and don't so much clamp onto the head as just sit around the ear and around the head. And it makes them incredibly, incredibly comfortable. They're also lighter than most other headphones in this same kind of category. And I just find them an absolute joy to wear. One thing that is worth knowing is that of all the headphones I've ever listened to, these could be the most open headphones I've ever tried. And what I mean by that is that I'm more aware of my surroundings with these than with any other headphone, and I therefore believe they probably leak worse than any others. I haven't tested that directly, but based on what I'm hearing coming through, I can only assume the same amount is getting out. So do keep that in mind, but also know that that level of openness in the ear cup design also makes them very open in their sound presentation and leads to their soundstage performance, which I'll talk about in a moment. From a design, accessories, quality of manufacture, look, feel, everything about the HD800S is spot on in my opinion, with the exception of those bayonet connectors that I mentioned. But in terms of the quality, the fit, the finish, the comfort, they've absolutely nailed it with the HD800S. So realistically, if the sound quality is good, these should still be considered one of the very, very best headphones on the planet. And in certain circumstances, I would absolutely say it still is. But in other ways, it's not. So let's start talking about that because for me, the sound quality of the HD800S is quite a mixed bag. It's a bit of an enigmatic headphone in the sense that when things go right, they are absolutely spectacular. But then other times, they just don't quite reach the same heights. But let me explain what I mean. Enjoying this video? If you are and you'd like to help me make more videos like this one, there are lots of ways you can help and most of them don't cost you a cent. You can help for free by liking this video, subscribing and ringing the bell, sharing this video on social media or your favorite audio forums, or by making your next purchases using any of the affiliate links in the description. Obviously that's not technically free, but you're not spending anything extra and it all helps out. Want to go a step further? You could buy some merchandise, t-shirt, hoodies, caps and the like, or you can join the Passion for Sound family on Patreon. It's a growing community with plenty of interesting discussion and your chance to influence what happens on the channel. Check out the description for more information and links where relevant. But for now, let's get back to the video. The overall sound quality, if I had to sum up in one word from the HD800S, it's that it's incredibly transparent in the sense that you feel like there's nothing between you and the music. They just lay it all out in front of you in this beautiful big sound stage with very, very good imaging as well. And you just feel like you're hearing everything there is to hear. But the other side of that coin is that their treble is still a bit peaky. Sennheiser's engineers worked hard to pull back the treble spikes that plagued the original HD800 and whilst I think they've done generally a really good job, the overall tonal character of the HD800S is still a little bit brittle, a little bit peaky, and can at times get just a touch edgy. What that also means is that the overall balance of the sound is just a little bit thin for me in terms of the note weight. 
and I think that's entirely because of the treble peaks and the general presentation of the notes. And what I mean by the general presentation is if you've watched my Utopia review, I found that the Utopia, whilst having a very similar frequency response, delivered everything with a sense of smoothness, and that actually allowed it to sound a bit fuller in note weight, even though the frequency response would suggest that it's not a warmer headphone. What I feel like with the HD800S is that there's often just a little bit of body missing from the sound, and I'm left wanting just a little bit more oomph out of them. To give you an example of what I mean, one of the patrons of the channel recently recommended the album Symphonic by Thievery Corporation. One of the tracks on that album is called The Forgotten People. And as I was listening to that with the HD800S, what I noticed was that during the opening, the initial orchestral part of the arrangement sounded absolutely fantastic on the HD800S. It was throwing spatial cues that made me think that there were sounds happening outside of the headphone. It was beautifully clear, there were lots and lots of textures, and I was just thoroughly enamored with the sound. Then the beats kicked in, and the sound continued to be super articulate, really exciting, and really interesting to listen to. But at the same time, I suddenly became aware that there was something missing. There was a lack of weight through the bass and the mids that left me wanting more. I felt like the track needed more punch and more drive, and the HD800S just wouldn't give it to me. And the reason I think this track is such a good example of why I find the HD800S a little bit enigmatic is that it shows both sides of the HD800S perfectly. That opening section, which is very orchestral, sounds absolutely fantastic. Once you get into the more pop and electronic sounds as the track moves on, that reveals where the HD800S Achilles heel is and that's in that lack of note weight. So for me, at this point in my notes, what I wrote down was that I felt like the HD800S is still maybe the king, if not it's right up there with the other best headphones for classical music, chamber music, you know, small acoustic pieces even, anything that doesn't require a lot of drive and a lot of bass weight, it's going to do beautifully. And I probably shouldn't even say a lot of bass weight. Anything that requires some degree of bass weight, the HD800S is going to be a bit lacking. And I'll run through some examples in a moment as to what I mean. But before I do, I want to talk about a couple of other things. One of them being a comparison, and the other being talking about different amplification options. When paired with a high output impedance amplifier, the HD800S does change its character enough to start getting a bit more engaging. It doesn't completely resolve the issues in my opinion, but it certainly brings it closer to having the right tonal balance for any genre you might want to listen to. By adding an amp with high output impedance, which in my case was the Bottlehead Mainline switched to high output impedance mode, what I found was that the bass did get a little bit fuller and you still were able to retain almost all of that transparency, that clarity, and that textural detail that you expect from a headphone like the HD800S. Unfortunately for me, I think there's just a little bit too much emphasis on the treble still, and so it never quite reaches a smooth tonal balance across all different genres to make everything enjoyable. And therefore, for me, the HD800S remains a headphone that I would only recommend to people for classical, acoustic, chamber, and those sorts of genres that I mentioned before. So to put this further into context, I put the HD800S up against what I see as its closest direct competitor in the Focal Clear. They're priced quite similarly, they're both beautifully made, although I would still give the edge the HD800S overall because it's lighter, and I do think it's a better piece of overall engineering. That said, they both sound absolutely wonderful, and so for me, they're two of the key headphones I'd be choosing between in that roughly $2,000 range. Listening to that same track, The Forgotten People from Symphonic, what I found was that the clears did have me much more engaged. They didn't have the same sense of soundstage, and they weren't quite as holographic, but they were still incredibly resolving, incredibly revealing, and incredibly enjoyable. More importantly, once the beats kicked in, they had the drive and the dynamics that I felt were lacking from the HD800S. So ultimately with the clears, what you're doing is you're trading just a little bit of transparency and soundstage in return for a more thoroughly enjoyable musical experience, even if you're using a high output impedance on the HD800S. I tried this test running the HD800S from the main line using high output impedance mode, and I kept the Focal Clears connected to the TT2 for something pure and neutral. The result was I still preferred the clears despite the boosted drive and dynamics that the mainline gave the HD800S. So my final test to make sure that I was accurate with my assessment of the HD800S's specialties being in that acoustic, 
classical chamber music type space, I put on my entire music collection on shuffle and just ran through a bunch of different tracks. The idea being that I would listen to each track on the clear and the HD800S to see which one I preferred from an enjoyment point of view, technicalities point of view, and to see which one I would choose if I had to listen to one headphone with each of those tracks. As you'll see from what I'm showing you on screen, I rolled through a whole bunch of different tracks from a whole bunch of different genres, different recording qualities, you name it, and without doubt, almost every single time I preferred the clear by a comfortable margin. That doesn't mean the clear is definitively the better headphone, I just found it the more enjoyable listen and the one that I would want on my head if I was listening to each of these tracks. Where things did get a bit interesting was where the random selection of tracks started serving me up some slightly lighter, more delicate recordings, and that's where the HJ800S came into its own. Now this was a random order, so the fact that we've started with the clear in front and then it's gradually tilted towards the HJ800S is pure luck and just goes to show you why I favor the clears, because in a random shuffling of my library, I'm more often gonna enjoy the clears no matter what I'm served up. In the case of Hobo Blues by R.L. Burnside, I initially thought I preferred the HJ800S because it was giving me detail of the recording space of R.L. Burnside's guitar, his vocals, the textual information of both, all of that sounded like it was better from the HD800S, which was the first headphone I put on. When I went to the clears though, I suddenly thought, oh, hang on, I feel like I'm getting sort of more of the harmonics and the tonal richness of the music. And so I flipped back and forth a couple of times until I finally decided that the clears were the one that made me feel like I was sitting in the room with R.L. Burnside, whereas the HD800S was giving me a magnificent reproduction of a recording of that space. So both were great in that context, and that's the reason I flipped to the clears, having had an initial leaning to the HJ800S. On Amelia by Herbie Hancock, I was again really close to choosing the clears in this case, because both rendered the sound beautifully. The thing that ended up splitting the tie for me was that the HJ800S gave me a wonderful sense of separation and texture in the music, and because it's quite a gentle track that doesn't need the drive and the dynamics where the clears have the edge, that's why the HJ800S came from forwards there. It just gave me a better sense of insight into the recording, and on that particular recording, that was what I wanted most. Finally, on Handel's Andante La Ghetto from Concerto No. 2, the HJ800S really showed what it's about. The clear was still fantastic, and the HJ800S did come across just a little bit light on note weight still, but overall, that's where the HJ800S shines most, is in that sort of recording with acoustic instruments, orchestral, chamber, and small group type work. So the key denominator here is that when you don't need drive and dynamics, and I mean dynamics in the sense of punch and rhythm in the music, that's where the HJ800S is gonna excel. But if you need dynamics and drive and punch, that's where they're gonna fall short, and where the clear, does take over for me. I would say that the clear is maybe 80-90% as good as the HJ800S on those orchestral, spacious, acoustic style pieces, but is easily better than the HJ800S when it comes to drive and dynamics and punch. If you flip that around, I'd say the HJ800S maybe gets to 60%, 70% of what the clear can do where there's that drive and dynamic and punch. So the balance for me just tips a little bit towards the clear. And so that's probably a good place to sum this up, which is to say that the HJ800S, in my opinion, is still one of the best headphones on the planet, but only if your tastes have you regularly listening to the sorts of music I've just described. If you're into soundtracks, orchestral music, classical, chamber, probably choral. I actually haven't tried it with choral, but I'm guessing that would be fine because again, you're not expecting that huge drive and punch that you do from say electronic music, blues, pop, etc. So if your tastes lean more into that orchestral, acoustic and chamber space, the HD800S should absolutely be in your collection or on your shortlist. If though you're someone like me that listens to a really wide range of genres or doesn't listen to classical, acoustic and chamber music at all, then you probably should steer clear of the HD800S and maybe look at something like the Focal Clear or various other headphones on the market that just do that bit of drive and punch and bass 
better than the HJ 800s do. I hope you found this review useful. As always, if you have, subscribing and liking the video really helps the channel out, helps it to grow and get in front of more people. Once again, don't forget about the giveaway of the Shandling UP4 and UA1. If you want to get into the draw for those, make sure you head over and check out the Jotunheim 2 video and the Shandling UA1 video. I'll be drawing it in the next couple of weeks, so stay tuned for the announcement of winners. For now, I'll leave you to the music, so happy listening, and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound. Music